these are uh, quite the slide we do for uh, first set of uh, here are some of the volunteers. Now, what I did is I went back and looked at all the volunteers we currently have and we've had the next. This is the first slide. There's going to be 150, 120 volunteers tonight. But it takes 50 just to pull this off. Okay? So anybody that's a, that a volunteer, either now or in the past, please stand up. Now or in the past, please stand up. They're all volunteers. And it's like, you know, no, no, no. In fact, we've got one more volunteer slot. There you go. So the organization is only as good as the volunteers. So when you get an opportunity, please see me, please see Wally. Let's talk about some things. We got all kinds of things. All right. This is fun talk. 52. Next one. Alright, the first drawing is going to be 126 bucks. Number is 190724. 190724. Okay, the next one is for a program, Southern State, 190861. 190861. Three points, Southern State. Okay. All right. If Barbara will come on up, Barbara will introduce uh, one last thing. If you did not go by the summer state, you ought to pick up oh. I'm an ex military guy, I use that for some of us. If you haven't gone by the summer state, pick up one of these maps. The North Carolina Civil War I Trust published them now. They've been out of published publication for about a year and a half. They just published them. They've updated them, shows all the different battlefields and trails around the state. There's a whole bunch of them up here for some state. They're free of charge. So if you want to travel around the state and look at different battlefields and stuff, monuments and all that, it's there. So I recommend you go by and pick up one. All right, now, Laura will come up and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. And for the final announcement tonight, it's a good to be back and this is Joe Slide. We have a great talk tonight. We have Chris Wachowski going to speak on simple murder, the Battle of Fredericksburg. Chris Wachowski, PhD. Is the editor in chief and co founder of Virgin Southern War. He is a series editor of the award winning Emerging Civil War series and of the Engaging Civil War series. Chris is a writing professor at the John Nolan uh, School of Communication at St. Bonaventure University in Allegheny, New York. Where he also serves as a social assistant dean, whatever it was, uh, associate dean, okay, of uh, undergraduate programs. He is historian in chief at Stevenson Ridge, a historic property on the Pennsylvania Valley uh, in central Virginia, and has also worked as a historian for the National Park Service at the Fredericksburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, National Military Park, where he gives tours for four battlefields, Pennsylvania, uh, Chancellorsville, 
Uh, at dinner tonight, uh, someone came up to me uh, and, uh, and she said, she did tell me she did she was okay. And she said, I expect the great things from you. I said, I'll do my best. But it's in those words, I can only do something. <laughs> so, uh, and then Bruce sort of has this reputation as being um, kind of this well intentioned lover and um, disaster in front of her. Uh, and then the attitude I see most often attached to Bert's on is affable. The affable is a respect. Uh, it's also the shortest tenure for men in the world, he's 77 days. Uh, and he doesn't know the tone to its grace, most lopsided defeat of the entire world. Of the so 13,000 casualties compared to only about 5,000 Confederate casualties. So when I first got to know the story of the Prince, I was like, what's this guy? And for those of you who've been to Fredericksburg, I'm going to be I guess you can hear a book and the stone wall and the Southern Road, and the Confederates are always stationed there, and the Federals had to get across this open plain, 900 yards against this formidable position. And again, what was Burns not thinking? He's thinking of the writer. What kind of India was this guy. What was that? One of the things I think that tonight we will leave with is a better appreciation of the fact that the Battle of Fredericksburg, while a terrible disaster, you know, is not entirely Burnside's fault. And we have many reasons to think that he would find success at Fredericksburg. And so if you go into hindsight, they will look at it as this Fire. Now, that's not an obvious shot of 
exactly what Frederick's not exactly to. He only sends half of the army to Fredericksburg under James Longstreet to block the way. But we put them back in the audience of stuff. The other half of the army under Stonewall Jackson has been off of the Shenandoah Valley to the part of the West, directly using supply lines. But we finally says, no way. We need to go up here. So you call Jackson in to help you use the Washington. As Lee shifts his first corps under James Longstreet into position, he actually already needs his tackle down. So we're here looking at the first of his army in Fredericksburg. Just before he left, he sends a little further south to a place called the North Anna River, half over from Fredericksburg, originally. It's a much stronger defensive position. Militarily, Lee sees that as the ideal place to mount his defense. But politically, he's not allowed to do it. Jefferson Davis looks at this and says, You cannot give up 25 miles of real estate for free. You need to go to the end of the battle. Not give up 25 miles. And Lee, he gets over the years and says, Okay, Mark. So he keeps sending this suggestion, suggesting that this is Davis saying, Davis says, We got the Fredericksburg. So when Lee's men in Fredericksburg, Burnside is on the side of the river, I think they can accomplish this. And so I said, All right, well. That spot. So much for that. You have to figure out what to do next. And again, he's got to do something. His predecessor got fired for doing nothing. He has got to do something. And he's got to do it relatively quickly. He's going to have to get into December. Bad weather is upcoming. And if he's going to move this giant 122,000 man army, that he needs to do it now while the roads are still passable. He also has to do it now because the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect on January 1st. The clock's ticking. And for that reason, it's not enough for him to do something and do it now, but it has to be successful all the way. There was a time to move the army around and do the chest and do the head bang and all that stuff. But this is not the time. The Emancipation Proclamation is coming. It's going to be successful at least in that So the birds are outside of the river. We can find the doctors. The first goes up the river. The Rappahannock River is shallow. But it's also very rocky and hard. The army across. You can move your infantry across fairly well, but you can't get your horses across, you can't get your wagons or your artillery across. There's that great scene from Dobbs and Jackson, some of you see the movie, and then Hancock says, Oh, no, the rocks are going to swap across the river. There's a cave out there. And then you can see the movie. And the scene in the movie is to make you think that Burnside's a part of the That's what the first thing you like to do is to part of the river. A cow can walk across it. A cow can walk across it. You can't get your voice to talk. You can't get your children to talk. Also, the wind has the winter channel down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These guys were never seen to make the rivers swell quickly and precipitously. So if you turn your industry across the river and then they're cut off from the other side, and they don't have supplies, and they don't have artillery supplies, and they don't have hands, you're asking for a massacre. It's good, strong military sense not to cross the river. Artist, what my match hopefully The other disadvantage of going up the river is that the last country actually branches into two rivers, which has two rivers that come together. One is the Rappahannock and one is the Rappahannock. 
to this set in motion. The early on hours of December 11th, 1863. And the man handled down off of the heights of the Dutch Empire start extending the bridges of the in my impression. Starts at a couple of points. It's also so cool that there's ice on the mountain. And he wants as quiet as possible. Secrecy is the key. And he does actually have men right down along the way. Start to They know that the odds. And a lot of the is told to let the devils come. The reason being is that up to this point, he has to go inside up to the curse of go. But now, if the Emperor Bill Parna will commit to this position, They'll put enough work into their bridges and they're going to finish it off and do the attack here. That's going to pin the Federal Army into this position. So if the large scale sharpshooters open fire too soon, the high engineers will put the work and then most of our side will be next. And they will be left guessing. Now, so the engineers continue to have to come in more than halfway of those directions. One of them, Wesley Brainerd, 50th in New York, looking for the early morning fog, and has a little bit of various so the fog clears, so and you can see the Confederates with rifles getting into position, and he knows that things are going to get And then suddenly, from the heights behind the city, a single cannon is shot. Uh, I accept. And Barksdale's men know that's the signal to open fire. They begin to blaze away at these bridge workers. You start getting shot, they don't run back. They run back to see. So our salesmen stop shooting. That makes the engineers say, okay, the things are safe. And they come back out and they start looking again. And they start getting shot again. And the engineers knowing that they have nothing to do but to go out there and die, what he says. And this is particularly problematic because it's not like they're regular infantry, these are specially trained engineers. What should you do that? Who is going to continue the work? It's a finite resource that the Union Army needs to extend. So, federal high command starts to go, We need to cross that river. We need to fly those boats away from the Rocky River. So, first thing we're going to do is get the chief parks of the Rocky Pines to line up more than 140 guns. Just start to pound the way for our position back. First time in America, one of our own cities bumped under artillery bombardment by our own soldiers. And as we were, we better take the hunger down and hide behind the wall and hide in the basements, but I'll put the rock in line or the artillery stops, and I'll go start shooting again. In fact, these dead walls smash. Falls in big holes that are provided with weapons. Millions of those shoot bombs. So the bridge builders, back as they continue, their attention to anything to destroy the city. Federal uh, command realizes that this isn't working, and so they're going to ask for some volunteers to bury the cross river in some pontoon boats and basically go house to house trying to get some better time. Now, the seventh Michigan will be directed to the bottom pool to do this. Yeah. Yeah. As this particular plan is just something you might do, but the engineers start popping up. Okay. So the engineers have to call that. I don't know if you've seen a plan too, but there it is. It's about 30 feet long, about 10 feet wide, are built for stability. And they're like big, hollow rectangles. They're very similar to the Navy's large ships from World War II. 
Okay, but because they're dealing with stability, they're not up to speed. And so when they come across the river, it's like snowballs. It's pushing that the wall. And so that lose its focus, sitting guys in the box. And the hard scale men start shooting at the what helps the Federals is actually the topography itself. And if you ever go back to Paris, wherever it's the great Alpha Supply Expo, which runs right along the river, and the bankers actually can't see, meaning that the Confederates are up here at the top, and she can shoot and shoot, and eventually they can't shoot back the lip of the bankers. And so the Federals get hit under their fire and blast further the river place. Protected by the marsh itself. That allows them to protect the land. They storm up out of the boats, up into the street, and they go house to house. Federal observers on the far side of the river can track their progress by the sight of guns and flashes from window to window, first floor, second floor, and the Federals will have to go house to house, street to street. Why? To why? Why are the feds out of their positions here? Besides, it's the first time in American military history where our army has been engaged in extensive urban combat. Now, there are times in the Mexican War, for instance, where they were doing urban combat. They never been trained for this in the point. As they cross the river in those boats, it's the first time in American military history where we had a river being crossed after fire. I want you to think about that for a second. We're trying to learn how to divide a city. We're trying to learn how to land troops under fire across the river. We're trying to learn how to do very combat. And for our first 160 years later, it's easy to look back and say, third time. So he's 
the top and it's the one that's straight out of the middle of the All right. Why are we not attacking? There's two weeks of talk. We did go back across the river and go down. All right. And you think, you think you have to talk to us he comes down the afternoon to talk to the south of the field for his great friend, their young friend, the commander of the East First Corps Commander John Reynolds, Sixth Corps Commander Bolly Smith, Third Corps Commander Dan Sickles down here, Sickles is buried down here, uh, from the Third Corps, and the other stuff. Bert Santasso, more really than Santasso. Sometimes. See that chair? I want to very well. I want to seize that chair. You just can see that chair. Uh, you just can see that chair. To seize that chair. All right, let's do it. Franklin's got 60,000 men on his end of the battlefield. Take that chair. There it is. Lost that chair. Set it up for you now. Meanwhile, the northern part of the battlefield, he tells his right wing commander, Charles Sumner, I want you to attack these heights. Because if you try to be out of this position in here and from that position there, you're going to force them out of here as they can test it. And a free black man comes from across the river and comes from the first side and says, Well, there's actually a boat in the third side of the river. It connects those two things in the line. It's a military job. And the third side says, Perfect. If I attack both ends of the line, someone's going to break through, seize that boat, and hold up the Confederate line one way or the other. It's sort of like if I wanted to attack this side of the room and simultaneously. Attack this side. We got to either try to get to the back, then I can use that back hole to move from one side of the room to the other. And of course, doing so, forces the guy out of the position to the top side. That's the third side. He shares these thoughts with his commander, but it says, if I say you're in arms, you're ready to attack the other side. Back across the room his headquarters, right through, ready to go. Time to get his orders. Until shortly after 7 o'clock in the morning, by that point, the sun is up, the fog is starting to burn off. The element of surprise is gone. His bird side order is as clear as mine. It says, I want you to attack with the division at least along the Richmond Road. I want you to seize the heights and then protect your line of retreat. The first half, or the strike force of this order, trying to figure out what it means. And then you know, obviously, this is an order that is so poorly written. I use it in my writing class to show students how not to write. <laughs> And so, so Burnside definitely bears some culpability because the order was supposed to get to Franklin by midnight. It's after dawn. And it's poorly written. But he says it by Korean, which is some of the problem. He says that right here with this word. And it shows up as a good order. Like, I don't understand this. What's he mean? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Why is this man bringing you a job to do a job that the final corporal could do? It's because that person should have that to can you know, explain what's going on. And, uh, and then he comes back to the first time to ask for it. And there's a telegraph office 900 yards from Franklin's headquarters. Nobody bought the wide open So, Mike completely abdicates his responsibility. He's a senior most guy in the field. He's 
got 60,000 men in his disorder. His first time they made a said, Do you think I sent you across the river with Captain Army to conduct a demonstration? I can say that. Now, what the Nether Frank and Burnside did is that the instructions that, that Burnside spells out correspond to a map that Burnside has looked at in his expedition. Frank, in his experts, look at his map, doesn't realize that his map does not match with the science. And so when Burnside says, take the rest of the road, Frank well, his map that goes someplace different. Then it does, first I have to have a From one of the first I have to have to take their whole course to the flank of the another position and attack the flank, which makes pretty good sense, right? The flank being vulnerable. But from the other side. So they could have just done it. The task of attacking the hunt. It was not even sent out of the It was just sent straight up. He picks the smallest division under George Warren Meade. He's got about 45,000 men, they're all armed uh, battle veterans. He must have brought about 3,800 of the veterans. He got two friends to come out of that division. And then he's going to go up the middle. He's going to have some protection on his left from an average double day. I feel like there's a little person who mentioned the other day after they would say that we didn't do this. Okay. And the government of the tag needs to be left flank and protect his right flank from the giant pits that are about 4,000 miles. The sixth corps would sit there and protect the line of the people who come out. And the third corps division that comes over to Sarah Anderson, he's going to drive the river down the river. And so there should have been massive 60,000 guys that one side is expected to attack that position. Now, what makes this even more important for us is the fact that Burnside burned the way to San Juan, converting those. Remember, I told you when he started to call Stonewall Jackson up? Well, by the afternoon, it was all police are dead, so we can have to sense to Jackson, bring everybody up. So, by the morning of the 13th, the final elements of Jackson's Corps are finally fully in position. And they're going to pull in right here. And they're going to occupy this part of the uh, farm. Long Street State is in position. Long Street's got more distance to cover, but you've got a much stronger divide. You've got the lights moving tight. <laughs> but right here, Jackson's full core in position. They're in more Confederates per square foot on this part of the battlefield than anywhere else. The first time they attacked this position on the front. He would have been attacking the weakest part of the Confederate Burning away that day, he's now going to be attacking the strongest parts of the Confederate Just imagine if he had fought this field and it was over there. Well, no sooner it is. Frank can get his guys going. And so much across the field, it's a bit of a boom over third. And now behind the side, one single hand of the line, John Allen, is written out. He serves with Jeff Stewart's Confederate Force Artillery. They're down here protecting the flag. And he rides forward, finds himself a little hollow behind some cedar trees. He starts blasting the flank of Franklin's movement. That causes the Admiral Double Day to take his whole division on a bad day. And instead of tagging those, Frank, we gotta stop him. And it converts an entire division out of this attack. 
We now set this down to only two positions instead of three. Held a single pin. The last two legs and ties up this full division. The second pin comes up to help them. It actually gets shot on the way out. Held the palm in his own hollow and was successfully in the book of Brandon's retirement. He will continue across the field. He will actually find an opportunity to break through because the swap the converts to the chain. And these men will swarm up in the net, push down here, almost almost down the next. But because there's so many men here next to them, so many throw reinforcements in, meaning desperate for help, sends word back to John Reynolds, his commander. I need reinforcements, and we can't find them. He's acting like a major, not a major general. And so he needs desperate for help. Then turns to the look at that, and he sees David Bell learning from the third floor. He says, you can come help me. And very, very ambitious. He says, no. <laughs> and he, you know, I didn't want to go You know how cold this book is. So he handles us with such a hat. He blows his stack. Looks like you will send over to vision to help my boys who are dying. And he has such a temper tantrum in one being said that it's though the very rocks themselves wet under the barrage of weed spray. And he pulls rank. He says, I outrank you. I will take responsibility. Very little advance his men. Too little, too late. As these men are driven off that hill. Given to men, meanwhile, also have success. They don't break through, but they bend the Confederate line back from a James Lane to North Carolina. In fact, Given will find himself fighting a brigade where three of his own brothers are engaging in combat. It's literally his brother against brother. And they will also be the pulse and driven back across this field. Here he will arrive just in time to prevent counterattack by a jeweler who will then retreat. And so all this is going on. Members on the other side, across the river, wondering what's happening at the south end of the field because of the acoustic shadow we can't hear anything. Wonder why it's Start his attack. So he sends word to Bull Sumner here to start his attack against his position in the tents. The orders come back shortly after 10 o'clock, and his men will come forward against that position. But the idea I had, you know, is I stood there by the smoke wall and the attacks, I went, Why are you sending that? It's that position. It's suicide. But the idea is that these men are going to have a lightning strike attack out of the city across 900 yards of open space. Confederates have their paint on out of the middle of that field. And because they're shooting from uphill downwards, they're not going to shoot at their own people, which will act as a huge storm to protect the Confederates or to protect the rebels as they do onwards. And so as the spurs came out, he can wait to strike them from the battle, sweeping them over the stone wall. Guys start stabbing, shooting, and that's how the breakthrough is going to happen. But because the way the federals are stacked, the first wave has a breakthrough, the second wave will come rushing up and break through instead. And then there's going to be a third wave, sweeping up and over. The lightning strike attack using the Confederates themselves as huge shields. Now it is uphill, but one thing that the Federals also have taken into consideration is the weather. Earlier in the week, it had snow. But on the 13th of December, the temperature rise about 50 degrees. So, what do you do to all that snow? What do you do to the ground? Most of them are wearing smooth soled shoes. They have no traction. So imagine what that's like going uphill in the water, trying to see the momentum. 
The other thing is the canal that I talked about earlier. Remember those rooms there? They tried to block it off and they tried to drain it. But there's still about three feet of standing water in the canal. Confederates are behind enough to meet up the bridges over the canal. Why do you think they did that? Anybody? I'm sure I'm hearing very good answers. So, the artillery position is so strong. Confederate soldiers, Edward Porter Alley, Edward Porter Alexander said that he has this field covered so well that when they opened, a chicken could not go down there. We got to be three and four five pieces of artillery on these fights. Meanwhile, on the Sunday Road, which is just below the heights, we thought it was about 2,000 men. Most of the South Carolina. And the four coast Confederates to do their advance had come out of the city and sweeping the division to just start blasting. The lightning strike the enemy, sweeping up across that field, get to that canal, try to push their way across those bridges and jump off the road and get over the other side, get back in formation, and Confederate artillery raining down on the bottom of the whole line and get moving again, pushing, using their momentum. Using their speed up that hill, they give them about 200 yards of the Confederate stonewall, and suddenly those infantrymen open fire, and the entire attack is off. 4,000 men melt away over the snow and over the heat. Such a powerful position for the Confederates that one of their cells and a thousand sheep of wind came behind us going home. And so, I was going to send more men in. We feel it's got a hay box division to the come. It's got about 4,000 guys, including the Irish Brigade, about 1,500 Irishmen, and up they come across that field. And they probably go in about 75 yards, so it'll get that close. But that constant sheet of flame is so intense that they do melt away. By the end of the day, of the 1,500 Irishmen, only about 150 of them are left to run around the coach. And so next, Oliver Otis Howard is going to excel this year, about 4,500 men. And as his men advance, the survivors were laid out of this field, clinging to the railway of the men as they walked past. They said, don't go! You'll never make it! Of course, I won't. You're all going to be okay. <laughs> And so Sturgis will be sending his men, Griffith will be sending his men, that's over the seven waves, will crash against this stone wall. And Burnside keeps sending them because they are supporting the attack by William Franklin at the south end of the field that is no longer happening. Because we have been repulsed with one of these And he has his own desire. And so his waves continue to crash against Marie's heights. Time to support for this attack. It's no longer happening. And when Burnside finally figures out that men have gone out, he orders Franklin flat out to resume the attack. Take that position. And Franklin says, I'll see what I can do. And then does nothing. And again, he doesn't tell Lisa. So these attacks continue. Now, if you're an observer of this military battle, perhaps you think these attacks may be successful. After all, the Confederates start sending reinforcements down into the southern road to take position behind the stone wall. It must be these attacks are exerting enough pressure that we're about to break. And that's what we need to do. We need to just keep attacking. We'll probably get through. But in fact, those reinforcements are coming down over the second 
And the only way to resupply it is to send it down into the world with the reinforcements. The final attack is in the field, which is known as the southern end of the same law, which has been the advance of our own tradition. The idea is to have a bad entry. Rather than mark out the process of it being sneak up from the sunburst, you know, the sunburst, shot to the last hundred yards, get into the sunburst, start scattering. And as the things do the energy, it's going to get closer and realize the chances of success in the future. Is that the same as Closer and closer, they're trying to search, so they're like, oh, my God. Huzzah! As they make their charge and their yell gives the way their position, the Confederate artillery on the heights turn and fire and blast it off the field. And then we end up on the And we get to the side. As the Emperor's first side tries to be extensive to his advance, he realizes we should put it on the wall. <laughs> and it's remarkable that something happens in the office. The first time that's trying to put on a great face, you know, it's a disaster. Various comments that are prepared for Birdside, which is he would have been dead. Now it's super bad. Birds are too bad to come to the office. But he decides that he can still find success in the country. And we're going to find his success here in front of this southern open in Stone Country. He's going to personally lead the men of the old Ninth Corps in spearhead against this spot. Those men have followed him throughout the war. They helped capture the North Carolina coast, off of the Newburgh uh, expedition up on the peninsula, and a tail into the seven days. Of the Tito, these are men of the and their personal loyalty will follow him from gate to heaven. And as he explains this plan to his staff, they look at him in wild disbelief. Because he's the only person who thinks he can find success in him. And his officers will try to talk about him. Try to convince this is how it happened. Who should be attacked on the 14th? The front of the little summer pulls him aside and says, Listen, I don't think we should do this. And Burnside said, Summer's advice moved him. Because Summer was a man that he saw as a comrade who was always looking to go forward. If an attack was possible, Summer was in faith. And for Summer to hear say, Don't do this. So on the morning of the 7th and the 14th, the teary eyed Burnside will call off his final assault. He covers behind the stone wall, will spend a day trading pot shots back and forth when the Federals were trapped on this open plain. At one point during the day, one sergeant from South Carolina leaps the wall and runs out with canteens full of water to give aid. To the wounded who died in the field. And the first one he goes to the country, he starts taking pot shots at them. What they realize is they're ministering to the wounded, they stop. Richard Thurman will learn that they became the angels of Marine Heights. They have acted with compassion in the midst of this war. And it is indeed important. Bobby Lee, with his command post, on the 13th, Watching the marshal display unfold for him, taking the heat and moving across the plain in the south. But it stirs something in his career military man. He puts his hand on James Longstreet's arm and he says, You did a good thing for what you're so terrified. He did a good thing for what you're so terrified. He did a good thing for what you're so terrified. 
and we did 13,000 casualties, most of them on the plane here in front of the stone wall. You know, the south of the field, almost 50,000 casualties, about 4,000 Confederate casualties because it was up close and personal. But here, Confederates suffered just over 500 casualties, most of them. Reinforcements coming down into the stone wall across an open exposed part of the hillside. Otherwise, this hill is strewn with the one who speaks. We let him go to the one who likes to talk. She grew up in the in better serious, as God celebrated their tremendous victory of the Yankees. Federal see this as God mourning the loss of the present events. It's not slowly moving back across the far side of the In the morning, the 15th of the week, we'll see that his adversary is gone. He's deeply frustrated because it was a victory that was completely fruitless. For me, he gains no advantage in geography. He doesn't destroy the federal army. He doesn't derail any federal plans. And he's stuck in this position, unable to counterattack. He was going to have to cross his army across the same open spaces that he had used to push the federals. Where he determined who he would turn. So he's deeply dissatisfied by this victory. Burnside, for his part, will take full responsibility. Even though members of the Joint Committee of the Combat of the War will come to Fredericksburg just a few days after the battle to begin congressional investigation. Leave it to the politicians, right? <laughs> And everyone's pointing fingers, the fingers all start to look happy. But Burnside, very handsome, says he's basically the Harry Truman. He's a Harry Truman. The book stops here. And he earns the respect of the officers for manning up. That doesn't last long with little input into this army, particularly in the way of disastrous loss on the eve of Emancipation Proclamation. It's going to be to such bitter backfire that these congressional investigators will start hearing all this finger pointing, they'll we'll start finger pointing, start pointing to Washington, to talk to the government, to talk to people. People will even go all the way to Lincoln's office to undercut the other side. But in the end, Burnside does not get fired. In late January, he was probably not so proud he says that the federal chief was far down or something far much. But really, it's all this political victory that Bob Reynolds gets them to turn his presentation over them, and we will accept it. But he does not fire Burnside. Burnside goes back to command of his night school. He'll get sent out to the Department of Kentucky. He'll do a fantastic job of getting Knoxville, Tennessee in November, December of 63, for instance. He'll do such a good job out there when Mississippi Grant comes east and needs to bolster the army of the Potomac. He says, send her inside. He'll get that blood change to send her inside. First of all, the guy is this fantastic engineer. Job after bolting his hat to crater. But like that bad we'll get elected to the Senate from his home state of Vermont. He like two terms as governor and so on the US Senate. He becomes the first president of the National Titles Constitution. This big statue of that kind of stuff is not much longer. And today he looks back after being this bumbling idiot in the capital. He approached Fredericksburg knowing he had to do something. The political 
pressure was irresistible. But at every choice he made, narrowed him down to a set of additional bad choices. He didn't want to do this. He knew it was a bad thing, and he knew it was beyond his capability. As a man of honor and duty, he tried it anyway. James Longstreet, after the facts of Burnside knew better, and was forced to act against his own better judgments. He knew. He knew. The disparity of casualties, 13,000 veterans, which he knew not much. We need to stay on the battlefield of the night. Now, hopefully, you can hear that understanding of who is going to come out to be the day. And if he did end up walking into a disaster, it was not exactly a disaster of his own. He found he got the first for his representative his best chance for success out of a bunch of bad choices. Now I know, of course, we have five success. It's in five variety of ways to describe 